be real nervous singing now with David sitting right beside me. <clears throat> well, the summer of preaching excellence uh, continues this morning with our uh, guest preacher, Ted Churn, who's the interim executive presbyter for our presbytery, the 125 churches, I guess it is, here in New Hope Presbytery. He's uh, very, very good at that, and we needed somebody like him. We needed a little calm, and he's going to be with us at least another year. So uh, we're glad to have him and glad to have him preaching today. Uh, he's, uh, by the way, this next year, I said he'll be not only serving as interim, he'll probably also be going to grandpa school. Uh, uh, Joan Castley may uh, tell you more about that. Where in the world is grandpa Ed McLeod? Well, he drops little hints on Facebook, and you'll be glad to know that your minister goes to church when he's not here. Ed went to church at the First Pres Wilmington last Sunday, and Friday he played golf with, uh, let's see, there were three ministers involved. Uh, John Rogers, son of Jerry Rogers, who was also playing, and uh, Bob Dunham from uh, Chapel Hill University Pres, where uh, John Rogers worked. So they all played uh, golf in the heat. This is uh, week eight of Ed's sabbatical, and the plan is for him to return September 9th and preaching in the new sanctuary. At least that's the plan. Most Christians believe that uh, all people should have access to adequate housing, but real Christians are out there on Saturday mornings building a house for them. Uh, Rob Fields and uh, Scott Peake coordinate that effort here, and Karen Johnson coordinates the meals to feed those uh, valiant workers on Saturday mornings. Uh, they can always use some more hands, skilled or unskilled. Uh, FPC shares, where we collect food and stuff for the uh, at least three of the p food pantries that uh, Carol Ann refers people to, uh, continues, of course, each month. Uh, for the month of August, it's your favorite. So when your family's there at the store getting your favorite stuff, get an extra can for the families. If they get 500 cans of beanie weenies, well, that's so be it. They'll, they'll eat them. Now. Um, I want to say a word about our uh, scripture reader this morning, uh, John Coggin. He's a familiar face. He's been worshiping with us uh, regularly. Uh, he's going to be playing in the handbells down the road. Uh, he has a master's in theology from Harvard. No pressure on your sermon, Ted, but I mean, this guy knows some stuff, you know, so. <laughs> and uh, he works at NC State. He, he, he's, his sense of call is being lived out now at uh, working at NC State uh, involved with the Emerg Emerging Issues Forum. So John Coggin will be our scripture reader. And this is a communion Sunday, as you can see. Uh, we have this at least quarterly and then on the significant days of the church calendar. And this afternoon, our elders will fan out to take communion to those who can't be with us this morning, but who still want to stay connected with this church and with their Lord. Everyone is invited to the Lord's table. And all are welcome here this morning. As we worship God together, please sign the friendship pad as it comes down the row. And if you leave us a phone number or an email, if you're a guest, we'd be glad to get in touch with you and see if we can be a further service. Please join in the call to worship. Let every voice shout. Every knee bow. Every mouth proclaim. Every life announce. Every generation tell. Every community give witness. Every church bring to life. The glory of God alive among us. Let us worship God.
Please be seated. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us offer our prayers to God. God, you invite us to feast at your table, and we reject your invitation. You call us to taste your goodness, and we turn away to other gods. You command us to share your bounty with others, and we consume at the expense of no neighbors. For those of us who are hungry, O oh God, give bread. And for those of us who have bread, give us a hunger for justice and righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of life, we pray. The God who challenges us is also the God who encourages us. The God who confronts us is also the God who accepts us. Be assured that God is with us even now, accepting, guiding, and forgiving. Thanks be to God. For the joys and concerns this morning, first the concerns, uh, hospitalized uh, still this morning, Vicki Pierce at Wake Med, but she did show a lot of progress this week, and, uh, but will be there a couple more days at least. Uh, Leo Hart was in Wake Med's intensive care this unit, but uh, my understanding is he did go home or back to Universal Health Care yesterday. Dee Campbell, a former uh, clerk of session and a uh, longtime elder here, had hip replacement surgery this week and is doing well in her rehab at Rex Rehab. Our financial secretary, Bonnie Hoots husband, Benny Hoots, which is always fun for me to say, Benny Hoots and Bonnie Hoots. Um, uh, Benny had some surgery this week and there were a couple of complications. He uh, finally went home Friday from uh, Duke Raleigh, but uh, Bonnie had to be out several days this week. Uh, Doris LeVere, who's a member here and is the mother of John LeVere, is uh, finishing up her uh, stay at, uh, in rehab at Rex Rehab in Apex. She had a fractured pelvis, I think. She's, uh, we're going to take homebound communion to her today, and then she may be going home tomorrow. And Dot Hoover celebrated her 90th birthday Wednesday, and then with a party yesterday, which she said would go on until 8 o'clock, and that late hour must have kept her up because she didn't come to church this morning. But uh, <laughs> she's, she, she's still pretty feisty. And our guest musician this morning is Emily Farmer. You can read a couple of words about her in the uh, worship notes, and you can see that she's headed to Carolina for a performance degree in French horn. She gets a pretty good workout at the anthem this morning. You'll enjoy her contribution to our worship service. One uh, death in the church family, Ethel Tyree Taylor died Wednesday morning at the age of 92. Ethel was not uh, technically a member here, but she uh, had attended over the years, especially in Dr. Al's time before she moved out to Lewisburg. Her son, Dick Taylor, just finished a uh, term as a deacon here, and uh, her service was held yesterday at Harold Poole Funeral Home in Nightdale. These are the Taylors who run uh, Taylor's Nursery on Newburn Avenue. Now would you join me in a time of prayer? Let's come to God in prayer. 
Creator God, we give you thanks for Sabbath time, for a day to come to church, for a week or two to vacation, to literally recreate ourselves and to recreate our families. In our busy world, may we fully utilize the precious opportunity to have a week together, to reconnect with each other and with you, to truly be present with our families and ourselves focusing on love and forgetting for a moment the trials and tribulations of a troubled world. Lord, let us savor the moments we have with each other. Time flies by so fast. Sometimes it seems like just a week or so ago that our construction project began and yet we may be starting to move in next month. Time goes so fast and is so precious. We pray you watch over Ed and his family in the final third of his sabbatical as he recharges his batteries, feeds his soul, and challenges his mind and his skills to return to us prepared to lead us into this next exciting time in our lives. In his absence, help, help us to tend to the flock ourselves. Especially we pray this morning for those healing from hospitalizations or disabilities. We pray for those in recovery from maladies, physical or mental. And we pray for those trying to get past something in their past, trying to begin anew. Lord, may humankind one day be as forgiving as you so that all might have a chance at new beginnings, new life, and new hope. We pray now as one. One body invited to the same table to share in the body and blood of Christ as disciples who pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to invite the children to come forward at this time if you can. We kind of have limited space down here by the Lord's table, but come down and find the space as best you're able. And we're going to talk about bread today. Our Bible lesson today is about bread, and it has something to do with this table here. What, what is bread? Someone want to tell me what bread is? Y'all don't eat bread? What's bread? Something you eat. What do you eat on bread? Is this bread? Well, what would you put on that bread? Peanut butter. That's good. Is, uh, is this bread? Yeah, it's like this bread only is called whole wheat bread. Uh, let's see. What about this? Is this bread? Let me pull, open this one. What kind of bread is this? Pita bread. You're exactly right. You know what? Pita means pocket, right? So you take, you take half of it and you got a little pocket. You can put hummus in there or chicken salad. And this comes from the Middle East. All the places Jesus went, this is a bread that they might have had way back then. Pita bread. Okay. Got some more. This one is in the freezer section. It's kind of a, oh, wait, here's another one. I, wait, this is probably one you've seen. Is that bread? Yes. French bread, right? Okay. This one is in the freezer section of the store. It's called Ezekiel bread. Let you, let's see what Ezekiel bread looks like. And they say the recipe comes from uh, Ezekiel 4.9, I think is the Bible verse where God uh, instructs them to, let's see, take sprouted grain bread, let's see, 
Take unto thee wheat, barley, beans, and lentils, mill it and spelt, put them in one vessel and make bread of it. That's Ezekiel 4 9. So that comes from the Bible. How about this one? This is Ezekiel bread, but it looks a little different. What kind of bread is this? Smell it. Raisin bread. Yeah, this is really good at breakfast. Put your peanut butter on this. Okay, so y'all have seen breads like this before? Anything these different kinds? How about this? This is the most special bread there is up here. You ever seen bread like this? These breads, we can eat these anytime, breakfast, lunch, dinner, but this bread we only eat today and only at this table, only as these people gather at the Lord's table. This is a special bread that we only have on communion. This bread is baked by Greg Martin. He goes into his kitchen on Saturday and nobody else is in there, just him, as he bakes this special bread. Um, a couple of the secret ingredients in here are whole wheat. It's got some honey and some molasses. It's really, really good. But we, we gather around this table. The only people that eat this bread are Christians who come to church to gather around this table for what we call the Lord's Supper. And to remember that Jesus said, He is the bread of life. And part of the reason we do that is to remind ourselves of Christ's closeness to us. Now, I need a volunteer for this next part. Who wants to volunteer? Patrick. I want to get you. Patrick's a visitor here. I know his daddy and mommy. Okay. All right, stay right where you are, Patrick. <clears throat> right there. Now, is, is this bread close to you? Is it closer now? Getting closer, okay. Take a little piece of that bread and taste it. Is it close now? Because you can feel it in your mouth and you can taste it. Tastes good, by the way. Mm -hmm. Honest opinion, I got it. Mm-hmm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what communion does because we remind ourselves that Jesus is so, Jesus isn't just far away. It's something we see in the distance, but it's as close as that bread that we can taste on our mouth and, uh, and feel it in our mouth. So uh, you can go back to your families and when we, when we comes time for the Lord's Supper, which is in the second half of our service, then we will serve each other and you all can share in this bread and in the cup with us and, and draw close to Jesus. So you go back to your families and wait for the Lord's Supper. Okay. Thanks, Patrick. As we prepare to read and respond to God's word, let us pray. Gracious God, oil the hinges of our heart's doors that they may swing gently and easily to welcome your coming. Amen. Today's first scripture reading comes from Psalm 145, written by David for all of God's people. Let us listen together for the word of God. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Today, we welcome Reverend Theodore E. Ted Chern, 
who, as Bob said, is presently serving as interim executive presbyter, stated clerk for the Presbytery of New Hope, and is the husband of Moffat Churn, who was our guest preacher on the 22nd and the 1st of July. And he and his wife are waiting anxiously, I think, for the birth of the first grandchild. Uh, I think momentarily, I understand. <laughs> He grew up in Baltimore and served, but then served a number of years in the New England area and finally came back to the south, to the warmth. Uh, he served before this call as the head of staff at North Raleigh Presbyterian Church on an interim basis. He and Ed McLeod were classmates at seminary. He said Ed was a year behind him, but Ed beat him to the grandfather business. <laughs> we welcome you. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is indeed a joy to be with you here this morning, and I'm humbled by your invitation to preach the word and do so with great humility uh, as we seek to hear the spirits moving among us. I uh, have to tell you that uh, uh, when Bob was doing some earlier introductions, he said that I came at a time when there needed to be some calm in the presbytery. I, I didn't really go looking for this position. Um, and when I was approached and asked to uh, consider it, I had uh, a lot of conversations with God, uh, trying to convince God that this was not something I should be doing. And, um, you know, it was a time when our form of government was changing. It was a time when the Presbytery Office was moving. It was a time when staff configurations were changing and there was just so much change in the air. And I said, you know, God, th there's just too much going on right now. I can't do this. And God would always come back and say, oh, yes, you can. And, and I would come back with another reason why I couldn't do this. And God assured me that I could. And I finally said, look, I'll, I'll bargain with you, God. I'll consider doing it at a time when there is calm and peace in the church. And there was a long pause. And then God said, and when may that time be? <laughs> so uh, having heard that word, I decided that maybe this was a call. And in the year that I have been here, I have certainly felt that sense of call as I have worked with our congregations and our um, ministers in specialized ministries and have sought to help us unify and celebrate our diversity as a presbytery. Uh, and it has been a joy. And this is one of the things I especially enjoy doing, and that is being out among our churches and being able to get to know, put faces with communities and get to know people on a more individual level. And finally, I want to express my gratitude, especially to the members here. Many of you have served or are serving on committees and divisions in the life of our presbytery, and you as a church, whether you know it or not, will be hosting our presbytery meeting come October. And we look forward to celebrating with you as you uh, re-enter, I guess you call it the promised land of the sanctuary, <laughs> and um, celebrate this uh, work that uh, has been, uh, I think, wrought by God but uh, has been possible through the faithful hands of those who have gathered here. So I, I look forward to that time when we're back together. Our second scripture reading comes from the gospel according to John. This morning's gospel lesson is probably one of the most important miracle stories in the Bible. It has to be important because it's recorded in all four of the Gospels. The fact that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the story points to something significant here about Jesus' ministry and mission. And a couple chapters later, Mark thinks it's so important that he tells it again, only this time there are 4,000 people gathered that day. Each version has a lot in common. In all the stories, there are large numbers gathered to hear Jesus. In all four Gospels, 
there is the saying, there is enough. There is enough. In all four of them, Jesus blesses the food before breaking it, and in all four, there's not only enough, but there are leftovers. But there are also differences in these stories. In three of the Gospels, the disciples want Jesus to send the people home, for it's getting late. And so they're saying, let them take care of themselves, for the hour is drawing near. In one of the Gospels, Jesus is with them in a deserted place, and another, he's on a hillside. In Matthew's Gospel, the people are uh, being healed, and in Mark and Luke, they are being taught. In John, there are more differences than in any of the other Gospels. The question about having enough food arises as the people are arriving on the hillside in John. There's nothing about Jesus' teaching or healing in John. John makes a point of telling the readers that the Passover is near, pointing to the sacrifice of Christ himself. And also in John, John is the only one who tells us about a boy who has fish and bread. There are two parts to this story. One points to the tendency to take control in anxious times. The other speaks to God's provision for all who are gathered. So let's listen to this familiar story and let's explore what it has to say to people like you and me as we live our lives today. Listen now as I read from the Gospel according to John, reading from the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 15. Listen for the word of God. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up, he saw a large crowd coming toward him. Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? And Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the area. So they all sat down, about 5,000 in all. And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments that are left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the barley loaves left by those who had eaten them, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, in whatever I say, may some word that is heard be yours. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> My wife and partner in ministry and I are about to enter a new phase in our life together. Any day now, we will be entering the company of grandparents. 
And I'll be looking to people like Sheila and like Ed in the days to come for helpful tips on how to be a good grandparent. And I do ask your prayers for a safe and healthy delivery. I've heard about the privileges that come with being a grandparent, the most popular being that you can spoil the child and then give him or her back to the parent at the end of the day. <laughs> Some say it's better than parenting, more joys and fewer responsibilities. Well, I guess in one respect that's true. But in another, while parenting did have its moments, its moments of heartache over a child's disappointment and pain, there were also so many joys and so many good memories that I cherish as I remember those parenting years. I especially remember the times when, as deceptive as it may have been, I wowed our children with the kind of abilities and controls that they thought were under my control. Let me give you an example. There was a time when our daughter was barely old enough to observe the wonders of creation. We would sit on this boulder, this big rock, at low tide on Skakit Bay at Cape Cod, watching the sunset. As the sun was slowly dropping out of sight in the distance, I would say, going, going. And then at the moment when that orange blaze line just disappeared off the horizon, I'd say, gone. Our daughter, in utter amazement, would turn to me and say, Daddy, do it again. <laughs> and I would say, how about tomorrow night? Same time, same place. Now I came clean with her and explained that this was one of the wondrous acts of God. We live in anxious times. And we long for the ability to possess the kind of power that enables them to believe that we have total control over our destiny. Anyone who has control over the sun rising and setting must be the kind of person who can just take care of everyone and everything. How ironic and tragic it was that those gathered last week at a theater in Aurora, Colorado to watch the final episode in the trilogy of the Cape Crusader who in this fairy tale kind of story had special power against evil, how ironic it was that they ended up being the victims of one who went on a shooting spree. We long for the hero. We long for the one who is going to come in and save the day. But we know, as the hymn reminds us, that even though this is God's world, there are times when the wrong seems off so strong. And sometimes, when we are confronted by those realities, we begin questioning the efficacy of our faith. There are, are those who either don't believe the miracle of feeding 5,000 really happened and that it was some kind of a fairy tale story, or there are those who believed it did happen but haven't seen any signs of things like that recently, and therefore don't believe it could happen anymore. But is it really about our faith or our need to control the final outcome, to make everything have a good ending? In the other three Gospels, the disciples wanted to send the crowds home. Now that would have been a good ending, you know, a good day on the hill with 5,000 people teaching, healing, preaching, whatever Jesus was doing, and then ending the day maybe with a benediction and sending them home. That was the way the disciples wanted to control that situation. And their fear was that if they didn't take control, bad things were going to happen. 
Jesus' reputation would be tarnished. The mission would be compromised. All that they had given to the cause would be lost. It was time to make this event end well. Send them home, Jesus. Send them home. It's nice to have such a large turnout. It's nice to be so popular. But nighttime is falling. We have no food. They need to take care of themselves. Send them home. Now, John puts a little different twist onto the story. In John, Jesus has an intuitive nature about him. The crowd is gathering, and Jesus already knew that the disciples, being the worry warts that they were, would want to start to send the crowd away at some point. And so Jesus, testing Philip, says, So, Philip, we've got quite a crowd here. How do you suppose we're going to buy enough bread for all these people to eat. And then suddenly, panic sets in. The disciples begin to scamper. They take an inventory, and they come up with a boy who has five barley loaves and, five barley loaves and two fish. And they knew that that was not going to be enough. Panic was now the order of the day for those disciples. And maybe that's why we struggle with this story. We live in a world that is driven by the scarcity mentality. We fear that there will never be enough, like the disciples feared there was not going to be enough that day. Whether it's trying to avoid some horrifying event or the constant worry of running out, it's our nature to kick into the control mode, to take care of everything. We are tempted to treat this event as a sentimental story of something that Jesus did long ago, but something that just really has little relevance in our lives today. And so we need, we need to be in control. Some time ago, the Wall Street Journal ran an article describing the fastest growing business in America today. And you might be surprised to learn that the fastest growing business is the construction of many warehouses, those small storage facilities that you see across the landscape of our nation. We filled our closets, we filled our attics, we filled our basements, we filled our garages, and now we go across town and we rent a space and store more stuff. Now I know there are expectations, there are exceptions for those who live in settings where they don't have much in the way of storage. But when do we have enough? And what drives us to think we will never have enough? A reporter once asked a famous politician who was in the height of his career, how much is enough? And he responded, just a little more than I have. I wonder if the disciples would have been less anxious if the boy had 10 loaves and four fish or 20 loaves and eight fish. Philip said, look, Jesus, even if we had six months wages, we couldn't do it. There were 5,000 mouths to feed. And in the disciples' mind, 5,000 going hungry could be enough to incite a riot. But if we are able to get beneath the layer of miracle in this story, that is, if we are able to spend less time trying to figure out how so many could get fed with so little, if we can get beneath that, what we witness is a testimony to God's faithfulness to God's people. What is truly wonderful is not that a human being somehow multiplied loaves and fishes. What is at the heart of this story is that this person represented a sign of hope and healing that that fed the spiritual hunger of hundreds, thousands of people. They followed because their hunger for the bread of life had been assuaged. John, the gospel writer, points to miracles as signs of something greater than the miracle itself. This was the sign that God was in Christ, that indeed the word became flesh 
and had drawn close to the people of God. Isn't it interesting that in all four versions of the story, there is not one mention of people saying, Jesus, you know, we are getting hungry here. Could it be that the reason for that was they were being fed by another kind of bread? Could it be that these people, for the first time, experienced someone who was not interested in what he could get out of them, someone who wasn't preoccupied with whether or not they were going to observe the rituals in the right way, but someone who knew them, someone who knew their pain, their struggles, someone who saw them as individuals with real needs, needs that went far deeper than their physical hunger for bread, someone who really knew them, loved them, valued them, each one of the 5,000, as children of God. There were no gates. There were no fences on that hillside. All were welcome. Last Sunday, my wife made reference to the late Fred Rogers in her sermon, and Fred Rogers is held in high esteem in our household. Early in my ministry, he was often my lifesaver. When I served my first church, and I didn't know what I was doing in ministry, and I would come home from some stress-filled days, and our children would be sitting in front of the television watching Mr. Rogers, and I would hear that famous tagline, I like you just the way you are. And I stood in the dining room saying, thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Now, I know that as good Reformed Presbyterians, we don't remain content with the way we are. We grow into the people God is calling us to be, and we acknowledge those times when we are not growing into it by confessing our sins, seeking God's forgiveness, God's grace to help us start again. But I think what Mr. Rogers was really saying was something like what Paul Tillich said, you are accepted. This is the starting point in our relationship with God. You see, I think those 5,000 people on the hillside that day found the kind of acceptance they never before experienced. And they were so caught up in the presence of Jesus that they had forgotten about mealtime. It was the disciples who were preoccupied with feeding the masses. Have you ever been with someone and you just felt so at home, so at ease, so caught up in conversation, and at one point you look at your watch and you say, oh my gosh, it's midnight and we haven't even had dinner. I don't think physical hunger was first and foremost on their minds. John and the other three gospels say to those who are so focused on the miracle of bread being multiplied, you think that was something, there were even leftovers. So try to figure that one out. But if you're putting your energy in trying to understand how that happened, then you will miss the real miracle of this story. You will miss the why question. It happened because God loved God's people because God acted out of deep compassion, care, and concern for all those gathered. And if you are so consumed with the need to prove it to someone because all you want to do is show others the notch on your belt for saving another soul, then you have denied that someone the opportunity to experience the miracle of Christ through your presence, through your compassion, through your attentiveness to his or her most pressing need. John ends this story in a different way. Unlike the other disciples, Jesus went out and hid in the hills 
when he learned that they were about to take him by force to make him king. For Jesus, this day on the hillside was not about calling attention to himself so that he could gain prestige, power, fame. It was about what God was about to accomplish through him in the world. The story isn't about how God once impressed people long ago and far away with out-of-this-world kind of miracles. Jesus had no interest in the human kind of accolades that are bestowed on kings. His only interest was making known God in their midst. And so when he heard about the plan to kidnap him and make him king, he headed for the hills. I'm currently reading the book, Good to Great, and the author says, we reach level five toward greatness when we remember that it is never about ourselves. Level five is about humility. In the business world, the success of a level five leader is measured by how well the company succeeds and flourishes after that leader has left the country. Now, given that kind of measurement, I would say Jesus excelled at level five. And so we live with this deep humility and this gratitude for the God who continues to visit us, who lives among us, even in the most horrific times, even in our most anxious times. For even though the off does seem so strong, God is the ruler yet. God is presence. God is present. And God's presence is made real as we are attentive to the greatest human need, the hunger to know that we don't have to determine the outcome, that God is present, and that God is still at work in us and through us and among us each and every day. You see, I think the real miracle is this. There is nothing, not even our drive to orchestrate the outcome in anxious times. There is nothing at all that will ever separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, the one who is the heavenly manna that feeds us each day with the food of life. Thanks be to God. Seated. 
Offerings in our church take different forms. Some people once a year arrange a transfer of funds in December or January. Some people send in a check once a month. Some people have their pledge envelopes and put them in the offering plate. On communion Sundays, any offering in the communion plate that is not in a pledge envelope or part of a pledge goes to support our friendship fund, our signature ministry by which we share from our abundance with those who have very little bread. This time, let us present to God our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us enough and more than enough that we have warm hearts to share with those who have the least. Thank you for all your many blessings that we might do Christ's work and serve in his name. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now come to the table of communion. Let us come not because we must, but because we may. Let us sit together in humility and with thanksgiving, rather than in pride or possessiveness. Let us confess that we are not righteous, 
but that we love our Lord Jesus Christ and we desire to remember him. Let us come not because we are strong, but because we are needy. Not that we have any claim on Christ, but that Christ has claim on us and invites us to receive his grace. Let us worthily partake that he may be made known to us in the breaking of bread. Please join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give, give our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. In Jesus, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived as one of us. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, and broke bread with outcasts and sinners like us. Risen from the grave, he is seated at your right hand, leading us in, uh, to eternal life. And in the words of the Iona community, God, our maker, send your spirit to pervade the bread we break. Let it bring the life we long for and the love which we forsake. Bind us closer to each other, both forgiving and forgiven. Give us grace in this and all things to discern the hand of heaven. And so we join our voices with the heavenly choir who forever sing to the glory of your name. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Take and eat. And in the same manner, after the meal, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant shed for you, given for you for the remission of sin. As often as you drink from this cup, do it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our Lord until he comes again.